Hello, everyone. I am delighted to welcome you to our webinar today that we have called Advocacy in Action, Tools for Sparking Change. My name is Susan McNeil, and I am a program manager at RNAO within the Best Practice Guidelines Center, and I'll be moderating the call today together with tech support from Barry White, who is one of our project coordinators at RNAO. And through the call, we encourage you to use the chat box function, and you're going to have access to the um, tab on the right-hand side of your screen. So you can send us a private message, or you can message the whole group. So please feel free to share your thoughts, your ideas, your questions as we go along. And we have carved out some time at the end of the webinar to address your questions. Also, at the end of the webinar, we'll have a short poll that pops up on the right-hand side of the screen. So we ask that you respond with your comments to help us with future webinars. And I want you to know that we're recording this and archiving the slides on our website so that you can watch this again or share it with your colleagues. So here is an overview of what we're going to be talking about today. Um, you are going to be uh, learning about key components of the toolkit. You'll get ideas about how you can get involved and why this is important, as well as how you can take action for a cause that you're interested in. You'll find out about how, how RNAO can support your involvement in political action. And this can be anywhere, anything from writing a letter to meeting with members of parliament and much more. And you'll get information on possible next steps for getting involved. So in a minute, I'll introduce our guest speakers. But before I do that, I'd like to say just a little bit about why I'm hosting this webinar together with Verity today. Uh, the reason is last year we released a best practice guideline on elder abuse, and within the guideline we emphasize the importance of changes that really need to happen at sort of organization policy and system level um, in order to effectively prevent abuse. So, for example, securing adequate staffing. But like many other topics, including probably the ones that you care about, you probably recognize that changes at this sort of upper level do not often happen on their own and that they require some sort of political activity or advocacy work. So in the guideline, we actually recommend that nurses and stakeholder groups advocate for changes needed to effectively prevent abuse. And to help nurses in this advocacy work, we collaborated with Anastasia and the policy department to update the RNAO Taking Action Toolkit and uh, in this update to include some examples of work done on the topic of elder abuse. I want to make it very clear that the toolkit is not just on the topic of elder abuse. It can be used for any topic that you care about, and it includes examples from several topics uh, throughout. So now I'd like to introduce each of our speakers. If you can turn to the bio page. I've already um, introduced myself. I'm on the left-hand side of the page there. And next to me is Verity White, who's running the show behind the scenes today, and she's been instrumental in supporting the elder abuse guideline. Um, Anastasia Harapal is a nursing policy analyst at RNAO and the lead author for the revised Taking Action Toolkit. And our three guest speakers include Kathy Graham, Evan Mitchell, and Karima Aladina. So uh, Kathy Graham has been political in her work and life since the 80s. And one of her heroes, she says, is Kathy Crow. She's been on the faculty with the Trent Fleming School of Nursing since 2003, engaging nursing students in political action work that has been both personally and professionally inspiring. She believes that everything about nursing is political. In May 2015, just prior to launching a web-based fourth-year nursing course on social political action, Kathy was thrilled to discover the revised RNAO toolkit because it gave her course the structure it needed to help students understand the complexities of political action. Evan Mitchell is in his final consolidation semester of the Compressed Nursing Program at Trent University. Prior to nursing, he completed a four-year honors degree in psychology also at Trent. He says Trent University's strong commitment to social justice together with his own experiences within the healthcare system as a cancer patient and the son of a nurse, has sparked his interest and passion for political advocacy. He is very excited to graduate and to begin his career as a nurse and to continue on as a, on as a proud member of the RNAO. And Karima Aladina is the president of the RNAO Halton chapter. Karima has her master's in nursing from McMaster University, and her work experience includes national and international experience as a frontline nurse, nurse educator, senior nursing instructor, 
nursing advisor, professional practice clinician, and most recently as a patient care manager for the Medical Surgical Surgical Daycare and PACU unit, as well as for the pre-op clinic at Milton District Hospital. Prima is the proud mother of two young kids and enjoys any of her spare time with her two children. So welcome, everyone. Anastasia, now I'd like to, to have you to start, and Anastasia will walk us through some of the key elements of the toolkit. Thank you, Susan. So as a professional association, RNEO is very politically active. With support from you, the members, we release reports, have successful action alerts, maintain a pulse on the key issues happening on the front lines, and influence political leaders. However, many times when people think about nursing, they don't always connect our profession with political advocacy. So why should nurses and nursing students be politically involved? Well, there are so many reasons. First of all, we have a tremendous relationship with the public. We are one of the trusted professions and we see firsthand how policies affect individuals. Not only are we experts in health and health care, but we also practice in a holistic manner. This enables us to critically think about all of the factors that affect health. Many of our nursing competencies are aligned with political action. We advocate for our clients, we are skilled communicators, we develop and maintain therapeutic relationships, and we absorb many different pieces of information to inform our critical thinking process. Nurses are also a large workforce in healthcare, making, making it incredibly important for us to have a voice at the table when high-level decisions are being made. And finally, for nursing students in particular, you bring a fresh perspective to our profession and have amazing opportunities to engage in political action. So while nurses have every reason to be politically involved, getting started may seem daunting. There may be an issue you are very passionate about, but are having trouble figuring out where to start and addressing it. That's why RNAO developed this political action toolkit. So the toolkit is broken down into the nine sections listed on the slide. The first three chapters provide an overview and background information on political activism, and the following six chapters cover the major topics related to political action. So we here at RNAO recognize that nurses are extremely busy. So we developed each chapter to be self-contained. But having said that, we do suggest you review them in the order provided. So we really wanted this toolkit to be a resource that our members could just pick up and start using. So we designed it that way. Throughout the toolkit, examples are placed in shadowed boxes with relevant links indicated. At the end of the chapters, we created worksheets that you can just print off and fill in. We highlighted tips and text boxes, and wherever there's a link to elder abuse, you will find a purple arrow. So our first chapter is framing your issue and developing a plan. And this chapter is actually a new addition from our previous toolkit. Sometimes the hardest part is getting to the root causes of an issue, and this chapter helps guide that process. It's meant to provide direction on how to start planning your advocacy. So the key components to think about when you're framing your issue are identifying how it manifests at the micro, meso, and macro levels, analyzing the current context and key stakeholders involved, determining realistic goals, and creating a political platform. So once you focus your initiative, you can start planning how to pursue your goals. The amount of resources you invest will depend on the outcomes you're trying to achieve. So for example, the resources needed for a unit level policy change will be different than the resources needed when lobbying for a legislative change. However, keep in mind that every step in the right direction is a step forward and all successes should be celebrated. So the following chapter is called Working Together. Once you've focused your issue and developed a plan, you may choose to engage others and form coalitions. Some changes could be championed by an individual. However, some are easier to move forward with many voices. Once you've framed your issue and determined your goals, you'll have to decide if you will tackle it alone or by working in a group. So some factors to consider when deciding to create a team include the benefits and challenges to working in a group, 
the type of advocacy you're planning to engage in, the types of skills and resources needed to achieve your goals, and if your potential partners have similar values as you and if they are invested in your proposed outcome. You have to be careful because you may find others with a similar passion for an issue, but they could want completely different outcomes and be willing to take steps that are incongruent with your values to achieve them. So if you are going to form a team or a coalition, um, do some research on your potential partners. The next chapter goes into working with senior administrators and politicians. In order to advance your goals, you may work with senior administrators, board members, politicians, or other decision makers. When, you're, when you are considering political action, these individuals may be important to advancing your agenda. However, when you're engaging with them, help them solve the problem and position yourself as a stakeholder that's willing for, on, for an ongoing relationship. There are many strategies you can use to engage with these stakeholders, and they typically range from low-profile approaches, such as writing a letter, to high-profile approaches, like picketing outside an office. The issue and your comfort level will inform the type of strategy you use, but remember, it's very ineffective to go from a high-profile strategy to a low-profile strategy. The next chapter in the toolkit is RNAO's Media Relations Strategy Guide. So spreading your message and work through the media is a great way to move your agenda forward. And RNAO's communications department prepared this guide to assist you in dealing with the media, preparing news releases, and writing letters to the editor. It will also help you create a successful media relations strategy and, may, and help make your experience dealing with reporters less intimidating. So one of the new pieces attached to this media relations strategy guide is on the use of social media. So social media has become a part of everyday life, and it includes Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and other outlets. While social media can be an effective tool for political action, it must be used in a strategic and thoughtful way. So the way you use social media to advance a political issue will be very different from how you use it in personal life. And this section will provide guidance on how to use social media appropriately when you're using it for political advocacy. And the final chapter focuses on becoming active in an election. Elections are a strategic time to advance political issues. And this section provides political action strategies specific to elections. It offers strategies on how to communicate a nursing perspective on health-related issues to candidates. And it also describes different forums you can organize or use to disseminate your views and ideas. With the upcoming federal election, you may find this chapter particularly useful. And last month, RNAO released our federal platform. If you haven't seen it yet, it's located on RNAO's webpage on the rotating carousel. So now that we've given you an overview of the toolkit, I'm going to pass it over to our first guest speaker, Kathy Graham. Thank you. And um, thank you for arranging this webinar and um, for giving me the opportunity to talk about um, how useful this tool has been to me. And so the slide that you're looking at illustrates uh, its usefulness in both the academic context and the professional context. And I'm just going to talk a little bit about the academic context first. Um, I use the toolkit and Kaminsky's Nurse Activism Framework in a 12-week web-based course with fourth-year students. Um, and I have to say it was quite a challenge to bring 30 students in groups of five or seven, um, who had very diverse experiences, geography, clinical practice settings, and interests um, in developing collaborative relationships online. It was also quite challenging in some cases to bring the students up to speed on current issues uh, in nursing. Um, with regards to the toolkit, I was very familiar with and had used previous iterations of this toolkit, as well as other critical analysis frameworks. So we have a 12-week course um, with fairly 
um, specific components. Um, and what the toolkit did was really provide comprehensive discussion and examples of various components, which is very useful for both individual and group work, including the worksheets. And I built key components of the toolkit into the evaluation criteria for both individual and group assignments. So students individually had to write a letter to the editor, um, and they also had to work collectively uh, as group members to uh, essentially gather themselves via a Google Doc to decide as a group on a current issue to do with nursing health or health care they wanted to focus on. And this took um, some time to do, but was absolutely essential to the process and ultimately decided that, that what they wanted to uh, work on uh, were diverse issues around cuts to full-time nursing positions in Ontario, to look at and lobby for a national pharma care program, um, to look at the issue of elder abuse, and this was really focused within Ontario, um, end-of-life care choices, um, informing and engaging voters in the election, federal election, and uh, finally, and this is the work that Evan's going to talk about, the First Nations uh, issues around health and health care access. From a professional context, I found the kit very useful around putting together um, information um, with regards to um, three all-candidates meetings that um, our chapter, the Court of Victoria, uh, is hosting, and we are co-hosting one actually tonight in Coburg with the Durham Northumberland chapter. So, I mean, I think in summary, what I have to, what I would like to impart is, it is a very detailed toolkit. It is very comprehensive. It, in fact, is quite user friendly. And um, I, I think the students would agree with some variation uh, that it uh, was useful for their learning. And for many of these students, they became very informed about the issues that they'd chosen to focus on. And even though the course has ended, um, they have, uh, some of them anyway, have continued to be politically involved whether it be in the issues that were the focus of this course or not. So um, that's my contribution. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kathy. It's wonderful to hear about how the toolkit is really being um, used at your school and also how it's uh, so pertinent to what's happening with the upcoming election. So thank you so much. Uh, next, I'd like to uh, turn it over to Evan who is one of your students at Trent, uh, Trent Fleming School of Nursing. So Evan, go ahead. Thank you very much. So uh, as stated in the preamble, my name is Evan Mitchell and I'm a student member of the RNAL. And I'm currently in my fourth year of the Compressed Nursing Program. And today I'm very briefly going to talk about my experiences working with the RNAL Toolkit. I recently worked with the Toolkit on a project for a fourth year advanced topic nursing course in political advocacy. And the project was to, in groups, enact some form of political advocacy from the scope of the student nurse. The course professor, Kathy Graham, gave students a few vital resources that we could utilize, including the RNO Toolkit. And initially, when beginning the journey to become politically active, many students, including myself, have really no idea where to begin. And in my own experience, this is really one of the hardest parts of becoming politically active. But it's also one area that the Toolkit is so effective in guiding students and nurses. The toolkit first aids in creating a solid foundation for activism by guiding one to find a clear issue using a situational analysis, defining an issue clearly and finding one that's workable and relevant and of vital importance because it paves a feasible path towards success. So my group members and I were very interested in advocating for access to health care for Indigenous peoples in Canada. For myself, I think being from Peterborough as well as having gone to Trent for my previous degree, has really opened my eyes to some of the obstacles that Indigenous peoples in Ontario face in accessing, in accessing health care. So after having decided upon a broad topic, each of the members of our group conducted a situational analysis to better understand the nature of our selected issue. Many of the statistics that were obtained in our analysis are shown on the infographic that's seen on the slide. My own specific analysis revealed that Indigenous women in Canada suffer from disproportionately higher rates of acute and chronic illness, use and violence, suicide rates, and overall mortality. And interestingly, 
All these statistics are related to the obstacles that Indigenous women face in receiving health care in Canada. So after determining this information, I knew immediately that this was something I wanted to get involved with. And from here, I began to research some of the Indigenous women's groups in Ontario. So I was really looking for an opportunity somewhere to build a coalition, as the toolkit suggests. The toolkit is an excellent resource in this regard, providing worksheets to lay out important people and groups to build coalitions with. When I was looking around on the Native Women's Association of Canada website, I found that they were involved with a group called Up for Debate. Now, Up for Debate is an alliance of over 175 women's organizations founded on the collective goal of raising awareness of women's issues and the status of women in Canada leading up to the 2015 federal election. And when I came across this, I knew immediately that this was the group I wanted to work with. Not only did the group's mission reflect my own in promoting the awareness of injustice that Indigenous women endure, but it was also tied in with a federal election and they were looking to hold political leaders accountable for the gender inequities that exist in Canada. At this point, I now had a specific issue that I was very passionate about, and also a group that I wanted to work with. And from here, working with the toolkit, it became a very organic experience of creating a plan of action using the SMART goal format that's outlined. Using the SMART format, I created goals that you can see at the bottom of the slide. But before I carried out any action, I contacted Up for Debate to ask if I could use some of their images and the literature on their site to promote their, to promote their petition and their political action. And I have to say, I was so encouraged when Up for Debate emailed me back within a day with such a supportive letter, stating that they were very excited that Trent University nursing students had taken an interest in their cause, and that I could absolutely use whatever I needed to create my own social media page to raise awareness for this cause. They also offered me resources that I could use in my project, as well as the email of their online social media specialist, which was infinitely helpful. So the outcomes of my political advocacy can be seen in part on your slide. I did create a Facebook page that I spread within my own social network to promote Up for Debate. And this page is still being kept current with the latest news from the Up for Debate movement. I also did send persuasive letters to two members of Parliament on the issue. And again, the toolkit has been infinitely helpful in guiding me in all of these processes. And finally, and most importantly, on September 21 and then on September 28, this is now six weeks since the course has ended, the Up for Debate Alliance released videos of interviews with each of the federal election candidates, with the exception of Stephen Harper, who declined, as they discussed how their governments will make positive change to the gender inequality that exists in Canada. I think it's noteworthy that one of the pieces of the project was to ensure that the political action enacted was sustainable and that it didn't die out after the course has ended. And I think that identifying an issue that you're passionate about is so important in this regard, but also engaging with stakeholders that are passionate about the same things really helps to ensure the political actions and movements don't fade away. I mean, here I am almost six weeks later and I'm still plugging out for debate as best I can. <laughs> so I hope I've done a good job emphasizing how helpful and relevant the RNO toolkit was in helping me to become politically active and aiding my group in creating a platform and carrying out political action and advocacy. Thanks. Thank you so much, Evan. That's really exciting to hear that uh, not only uh, this student project has learned has grown into something bigger and it continues to to um, to grow. So excellent work, and uh, your career in nursing is just beginning. So this is really looking good for us. So uh, next, uh, let's how will we hear from Karima about uh, her experiences of with being politically involved? Karima, I'll let you uh, speak now. All right, so first of all, on behalf of the Halton RNAO chapter, I would really like to thank you all for providing us with this wonderful opportunity to share our experience. Karima, could I ask you to just speak a little bit louder, please? All right. Perfect, <laughs> thank you. Okay. Is is this more clear, to, uh, Susan? That's great, thank you. Okay. So I just wanted to take this opportunity to thank everyone for providing us this wonderful opportunity to share our experience in using the RNAO toolkit um, in implementing the best practice guidelines. As a chapter executive, we have had the fortune to challenge ourselves in using this toolkit in many of our projects, uh, particularly the one in suicide prevention that was done last year, uh, as well as on the elder abuse program that was implemented in June this year. Using the toolkit to guide the planning and implementation of these events and programs has been a wonderful learning experience to many of us and uh, on behalf of my chapter, I'm honored here today to share our experience of using this toolkit um, during our recent event uh, on elder abuse prevention. As a Halton chapter executive, we realized that our community, like many other communities, suffers through the issue of elder abuse. 
we knew that nearly one in 10 Ontario seniors experienced some form of elder abuse. And we also learned that between 2010 and 2014, Halton Police had received more than 400 reports of elder abuse. While 60% of these reports were re related to assault, we knew that older adults in our community are vulnerable to many forms of abuse, including physical, emotional, financial, sexual, and neglect. So we knew we had a problem. And we thought what a great idea it would be to recognize the World Elder Abuse Awareness Day to raise the visibility of elder abuse in Halton region. So within the executive team, we made a small team of members who were very passionate about elder abuse prevention and wanted to be actively involved in the planning of this event. As a small project team, we agreed that elder abuse is a universal problem and that it can occur anywhere by anyone. And therefore, to raise awareness on this issue required that we involve almost everyone. So when we started to plan this event, we were thinking really big. And when we say that we were thinking big, I mean it that it was quite big. We were planning to work uh, with our TV producers locally to see if we could create a documentary film to shoot a real life images of people experiencing elder abuse. Idea was great, and probably this initiative could have created um, an endless number of possibilities to raise awareness on elder abuse. But as we went along, we realized that we have not even considered the basics of planning of the event. We didn't realize who was our target at this time. We didn't realize what resources, that including time, finances, and human, that we have in our hands to plan this event. Uh, we got in touch with some of the leaders within RNAO Home Office, and with their direction, and as well as the, with the direction of the toolkit and the support we received from the RNAO Home Office, we realized that our time frame is really very short to think so big. And we then learned that we will have to narrow down our scope of this project in order to make it more realistic, yet practical and resourceful for our community members. So first, we did that uh, by developing our goal. We identified that we wanted to create more awareness within Halton region on elder abuse. We knew that elder abuse is like a big elephant in the room, and not many people wanted to talk about it. So our goal was to hold an open and honest dialogue so that we can better address elder abuse and protect Halton Region's older population. With this goal in mind, the toolkit offered us to set our target and to identify the resources. Our target was very clear to us. We knew that this event would be for all the members within the community and that it would be held at free of cost to all our community members. <clears throat> Now to identify the resources in elder abuse domain, we pulled the RNAO best practice guideline, preventing and addressing abuse and neglect of older adults, person-centered collaborative system-wide approaches. Luckily, this best practice guideline was really hard off the press. This best practice guideline helped us identify our resources. We learned that there were several stakeholders who were involved in developing this best practice guideline and so we started contacting each of these stakeholders. We wanted to ensure, uh, in addition, that the political leaders were also involved in this discussion so that the public is aware of any policy decisions that may be required to support the prevention of elder abuse in Halton. To plan further, we collaborated with the Halton Regional Police as well as Elder Abuse Ontario, and we, recommend, we, we suggested that they become our partners in, in planning and implementing this event. So now, which they luckily, fortunately agreed. So now we were a larger team. We were three major organizations representing to plan this event. So it was Halton Regional Police, Elder Abuse Ontario, as well as RNAO Halton Chapter. And together as a larger team, we thought that we need to invite each and every community organization within Halton that aims to prevent elder, elder abuse. And again, using the toolkit in conjunction with the best practice guideline, we invited almost 20 community organizations to set up resource booths or tables during our event. And we are pleased to say that out of 20 of those invited organizations, 17 different organizations represented their resource booths that day, including the one from RNAO, Elder Abuse Ontario, Savas, Crime Stoppers, and Halton Regional Police. Each of these booths provided practical, resourceful uh, information as well as strategies to the members of public 
on prevention of elder abuse. When we talked about the policy and political development programs, like in what is their role, we had our local MPP, um, Kevin Flynn, come to the event. And he actually stayed throughout the event, which was almost for two hours, and he addressed and provided his insight on the issue with policy and political lens. Most importantly, we uh, requested Veronique Boscat, who is the regional representative, who is our region four regional representative from RNAO, but also was a key stakeholder in the development of the best practice guideline on elder abuse, to share some of her insight on the best practice guideline. The toolkit also guided us to use um, to communicate this event with our target members, like what strategies are you going to use to spread this information to the target members. And that's how, again, we collaborated with the RNAO Home Office. We used TV Kojiko. Um, again, the RNAO Communications Department helped us develop media advisory, and all this was really spread quite widely across our local newspapers. So overall, I would say that our team had used the toolkit in conjunction with the best practice guideline, not in isolation. This conjunction helped, um, so we felt that the toolkit had served as a companion guide, and it helped us reinforce our goal and our commitment to plan and implement this event more practically. Together, the best practice guideline and the toolkit served us uh, as a powerful and resourceful contribution, and it helped us walk through the steps without skipping any major milestone. This combination encouraged a great deal of exploration as a team. It helped us identify the actions that may be required at different levels of planning and decision making in order to promote healthy discussion on elder abuse. And so um, we have heard three different uh, panelists, including myself, and I would say that I challenge today to each of you, whether you are a passionate individual, student, um, young novice nurse, or an experienced, uh, if you are part of a larger com committee, or even a part of a larger organization, to use this toolkit. And I would say, coming as a newbie using this, I, you know, you do not need a specialized training to use this toolkit because the content is pretty straightforward and it is designed as a guide. So once you use this toolkit, use it as a guide and use it as a work in progress document. Make it your own, find your own unique way to use this uh, in all the amazing work that you already do. Thank you again on behalf of the chapter and I, I hope uh, that you had found our experience useful. Thank you so much, Karima. And I really appreciate the challenge uh, that you have uh, spread to the group who are listening and your encouragement. Um, and, and also for nicely highlight, highlighting um, the ways that you approach collaboration with other organizations. So excellent work. Um, now I would like to pass uh, this back to Anastasia um, to uh, outline how RNAO can support the listeners and provide information on possible next steps for getting involved. Great. Thanks again, Susan. So now that you've heard from our absolutely inspiring speakers, I will go over some ways that RNAO can support you when you choose to become more politically active. So our association is well known for our political work, and as members, you all contribute to the association's initiatives. RNAO hosts events such as breakfast with MPPs, Queen's Park Day, and take your MPP to work. And here at Home Office, we issue action alerts, work within coalitions, and participate in political demonstrations. We also publish letters to the editor and present to different task forces and committees. But like I've already said, you as our members drive so much of the political action at RNAO. You are the ones that are meeting face-to-face -face with MPPs and vol volunteering to bring MPPs to your workplace and discuss nursing, nursing issues. But I do want to say that when you volunteer for these types of events, RNAO provides a lot of support. We develop backgrounders. Um, we even develop sheets called They Say, We Say, so if you get questions, you have a pre prepared response, and we also have orientation to these events where you can bring out any of your concerns. Our members also join RNEO committees and interest groups, which are always working on new and relevant issues, and we have a robust student and workplace liaison programs, which maintains the link between our members and home office. 
We are also actively engaged with chapters, and, and many times individuals from home, home office will attend chapter events. So whatever your comfort level, there, there is something you can do at RNAO to become more politically engaged. And always know that home office is just a phone call away. So if you have, ever have any questions or, or you need support, we're happy to help you. Okay, thank you so much, Anastasia. Uh, we're going to get to the Q and A in just uh, a few minutes, but or a few uh, moments. Um, but what I would like to challenge people to do is go to the chat box. You can ask your questions there, but also, can you type in, please, if you're involved, um, just the, the topic, if you're involved in any topics right now. We're curious to know if you're uh, politically involved in any particular topics, either at uh, your school or your workplace, um, and as people type those in, we can read them out. So that's the chat box, it's on the right-hand side for questions or um, points, that, uh, uh, topics that you're engaged with. Um, so I see climate change, excellent. Okay, I'll read these as they come out. Um, maybe I will uh, read the first question. And, um, oh, <laughs> there's lots happening now. Uh, speaking out about staffing changes and cuts at my local hospital. Um, basic income guarantee, banning conversion therapy in Canada, physician assistant suicide, nursing shortage. Um, someone's interested in becoming involved in advocacy for elder abuse, so I encourage you to join some of the groups that are involved in that. Uh, did I say physician assistant? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, excellent. So people are very engaged. It's wonderful. And um, probably many of you are becoming more aware of what the issues are for the upcoming election, which is great, too. Let's see. Um, Currently researching about injustice of homelessness and lack of funding for supportive housing. A national senior strategy statement from the Liberal Party. Um, let's see, is, is, is expected soon. And uh, all candidates meetings with uh, Kawartha Victoria, chapter with Kathy is involved in. So this is excellent, um, feel free to Scroll through uh, the chat box yourself um, on the right-hand side and, um, and continue adding to the conversation. And while you're doing that, I think I'll ask one of the questions, and this is probably geared most towards uh, Anastasia. Um, and Anastasia did talk a little bit about how RNAO can support people in the upcoming election. But this question from Sandy, she says, with regards to the current election, I'm confused over all the political talk. Can I have some clarification as where each party stands to make an informed decision that, oh, um, we lost it there, but I think just it was about making an informed decision. So Anastasia, can you answer that? Sure, Susan, and Sandy, that is completely understandable. Um, and in response to that, RNAO is actually releasing a platform comparison very soon. I actually think by the end of the week it should be out. And what it will do is compare each of the parties' platform on how they're responding to major issues that are coming up in the election. So where we will have that document available on the website, hopefully by the end of the week, and that should provide some clarity around some of these key election issues. Anastasia and Susan, can I just comment? It's Kathy Graham. There are, oh, there's a couple of resources out there, and one of them is on the Canadian Nurses Association website where they've put together um, both their questions to um, the, the candidates and um, there are PDFs of the party's responses. The other one that I have found quite helpful is a document, I think you can find it on the Ontario Health Coalition website, and it's a one-page document. I'm not sure how current it is, but at least it gives an outline of the various parties' positions on a number of things, including health and health care. Great, thank you so much, Kathy. And if anyone else has anything to add, um, any other suggestions, you can type them in the chat box. Um, also what we'll do is someone has just made a, a note saying that they don't see um, some of the comments in the list. So 
what we'll do when we send out the link to the recorded webinar, we'll also send you um, the link of some of the comments. Uh, there's also a comment saying the need for appropriate action from the federal law to require insurance companies to cover fertility preservation treatments and in vitro fertilization to individuals under the age of 40 who have to um, undergo cancer treatment in Canada. That is uh, an issue that Laura is working on. Um, let's see if there's anything else there. And there is a, there's an issue at Kathy Graham that the toolkit is really good at because, and I'm not sure uh, where this person is at, but you know, the whole, I mean, it's complicated, it's complex, who the stakeholders are, and the toolkit does a really good job. It doesn't do it for you, but it really helps you to understand the various layers and complexities of sorting out um, who's responsible for what, funding, um, the legislative piece, how power and politics is involved in this. Great, thank you, Kathy. Um, I'm seeing also someone, Lorraine is involved in safe walkable communities. Holly says that she's currently involved in establishing a written policy regarding the baby friendly initiative in her university. Um, Jennifer says she's not presently involved, whoever wishes to approach her MPP about pharmacare, dental care, making health better in Ontario, and deleting private companies. So um, excellent, really timely topics and uh, a lot of discussion, I know at least on CBC, um, about uh, health in on Ontario and RNAO has, has a lot to say about that as well. Um, Erica says that she's working with her AMOH on the basic income guarantee and also with Dr. Mulrooney at RNAO to developing a resolution to come forward at RNAO on endorsing big, uh, with, sorry, oh, B, basic, income basic income. okay, I don't know that acronym, basic income guarantee, great, thank you so much. So I, I have a question um, if we're, uh, oh, there's a question there, how can we access the toolkit that's directly on um, the RNAO website? And Stacia, do you remember offhand what the link is? Or, okay, we'll put the, the link in the chat box. Um, and uh, as people are adding other comments, I'm just wondering from any of our guest speakers, um, do you have any advice for people who are a little bit trepidatious about getting involved? They care, but they're a little bit, maybe they're a little bit nervous and they're wondering what, you know, who am I or how can I um, get involved? Any of you want to speak to that? Um, I'll speak to that. I think that it, that it, that one of the things that I hear in that question has to do with around the issue of coalitions. And that is, that's absolutely key to um, figuring out um, the, the risks and benefits, I suppose, as it were, for um, coalitions. Um, one of the things that I said to my students very early on in their work is, you do not have to start from scratch. What you need to do is, well, firstly, you know, get, get, frame your issue and then, there are people working on all of the issues that you're probably interested in. You just need to figure out who they are, what their focus is, and whether this is a group that you would like to work with. So that whole idea about coalition building is key, as Evan found out. Yeah, I was about to say, it seems like Evan had some great success with that. Um, Evan, do you want to say anything more about that? Uh, yeah, for sure. Um, I think uh, an important thing to remember for people that may be um, a little scared to get into this is that you don't have to conquer the world and you also don't have to do it by yourself, right? And those are two things that the toolkit really drives home is that, um, you know, just, just pick an issue that is workable and relevant, you know, define your issue, and then once you have that, um, you know, look for other groups that may be doing some of the same things. There are obviously pitfalls to that, making sure that the groups you choose have the same values as you, but um, you know all political action um, has value, and just to try and get involved is is you know worth that value. I think really. Great, thank you, Evan. Um, 
I'll, I'll read a couple more of the uh, questions. Uh, if, there's one question from Erica. Is this resource recognized and used by other disciplines? For example, health promotion specialists, nutritionists, physicians, politicians, municipal or regional staff, et cetera. Um, so when we were developing, <clears throat> excuse me, when we were developing the toolkit, we actually did a evidence search. Um, we went through the literature and we really tried to find academic resources to support some of the ideas that um, we presented in the toolkit. And we also used some books authored by uh, individuals that worked in policy analysis to get some of their tips as well. And is Susan, I, I would add to that that the toolkit we use, uh, we speak to nurses in the toolkit because we are RNAO and um, this resource is primarily for our members. But I think that any group would find the, the resources in the toolkit to be useful. So I would encourage you to share it with the groups that you're collaborating with. I think that it has relevance uh, across the board. Um, there's, a, there's a comment from, from Kim, um, and she's suggesting um, that Tim Lenarthowicz presented an excellent overview about the importance of health in both the federal and provincial government platforms, and maybe indicate to those online to watch for this information. So um, great point. Yeah, Arneo is doing some, some excellent work um, and in the policy department under the leadership of Tim. So great point, um, and uh, also added to that is um, the role of the federal and provincial um, government, um, and the importance at, at um, responsibility of health at provincial and federal levels. Um, a comment from Lorraine. Um, Lorraine, uh, this is excellent to see all these, these uh, comments on chat, so wonderful, uh, you can keep it coming. Um, we, Lorraine says, we brought in subject matter experts to meet with key nurses and it was very fruitful. It helped us focus and build on what was already happening and, or, or, and being done, excellent. Um, and let me see, where can I find Tim's work? Um, Anastasia, do you have uh, anything? Yeah, to I can connect with Tim and perhaps um, put the link to some of his presentations, uh, link to the page on the toolkit website. And the webinar archive will be on the toolkit website as well. And this is a, this is a good um, and tricky question that might need a little bit uh, of, of thought, but there's a question here that says, what happens if the work of an interest group or chapter is contradictory to the values or thoughts of the general membership or of RNAO leadership? And we're getting, uh, it's a good question. You know what, I think um, we, I think that that's something that maybe we can, can talk about and respond to in a follow-up email unless any of the guest speakers have any um, personal experience about that that they would uh, like to share. Well, I will say it's Kathy Graham that it's really important that your personal and your professional values and interests sync up with each other. Um, and I think there are pieces in the toolkit, um, actually right at the very beginning around framing the issue that might be helpful in, in sorting that out. Um, and there's also a lot of resources out there. Obviously, the RNAO is one, but, you know, students linked up with many, many, many diverse um, coalitions around the province and around the country, and in no small measure because they are so um, keyed into social media. So there are lots of ways of doing this work. Thank you, Kathy, and I'll just add to that saying that um, the, the section about using social media also has some really good tips on um, uh, it, it's sort of like a do's and, and don'ts for social media that I think would be really helpful and being, being aware of um, some of your professional responsibilities um, maybe uh, and, and um, keeping that, uh, just checking in about any conflict with your um, your personal and uh, your professional. Um, can I order a hard copy of a toolkit? Not sure how to do this. Um, 
Verity, any response to that? The toolkit wasn't actually um, printed in hard copy. We have the electronic versions available online. Um, if you see in the website, you'll notice that we've split it into the different sections to make it easier to access, but there is actually one file um, that has the entire document together. And I would suggest that you um, print that if it's possible. And if not, um, contact me at Verity White. Um, I think my email address uh, was on with the webinar information. Um, and if not, you can just give RNA a call and ask to speak to me, um, and we'll help you sort something out. Thanks, Verity. And uh, thank you to, it looks like Chad, who makes a great suggestion. And um, in response to the, the last question about um, if there's a misalign be, or, you know, any, any potential conflict, rather, between personal and professional, and Chad suggests that um, it would be important to link and collaborate with home office before speaking with an hour RNAO hat on. Um, and uh, so thank you very much, Chad, for that, for that comment. And just to add to the discussion, if you do have uh, views that are different from RNAO home office or leadership, I think it's really important for you to bring that forward and, and have a discussion about it with home office. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, oh, great points. Um, can I ask a, another question of our guest speakers? Is um, Are there a, any um, other challenges or barriers that you can speak to that you think would be fairly universal that um, you might want to advise our listeners on? Any challenges or barriers to kind of getting started that um, you encountered that you think um, you, you might have some, some tips uh, for the listeners. I, well, I think it's Kathy Graham. Um, the challenges really, and that's the beauty of this kit, I think are around framing the issue. I mean, uh, this, at least in, in my experience, but also with the students that I have worked with, both in this course and previously, is you need to take the time that's required in order to really take that that piece of the toolkit apart and look at it from multiple perspectives. It does take time. It is, uh, but and it has to be very thorough. But you know, and, and I suppose you, you know you can go down the track and figure out at some point down the track that you need to back up. Uh, because you haven't considered those things, but I, I think that is absolutely key, uh, is, is, you know, framing the issue or the critical analysis piece. Thank you, Kathy. Yeah, and, and also sort of that elevator speech, knowing what your, your quick talking points are or that 10 minute, uh, or 10, what is it, one minute, 60 seconds, 60 seconds speech. Yeah, knowing what, uh, how to say something concisely to the people who you want to uh, engage with the topic. So it's now, I think we'll, we'll wrap up now, and um, in a moment Verity is going to load the poll that we would really like you to uh, comment on. I would like to thank our wonderful guest speakers, Kathy, Evan, and Karima. Um, I think you've really brought this topic to life for us, and um, it, it feels like getting politically involved is well, it's not only effective, um, but it sounds like it's really rewarding and also exciting. So thank you so much for that. Um, thank you, Verity White, who has managed the webinar behind the scenes, and, and very much so thank you, Anastasia, for this excellent, um, comprehensive, high-quality work that you've uh, taken the leadership on with this tool, tool kit. And uh, all of our participants, it's been a lively discussion uh, through the chat box. Thank you very much for your interest and for your, your thought-provoking comments, the uh, questions that you've posted today, and uh, hearing about the whole range of issues that you care about and you're being, uh, that you're involved in. So please spread the word about the toolkit. Um, and um, once available, I encourage you to share the link of this uh, webinar to your colleagues. Um, so uh, you'll see the um, poll up there on the right. Please add your comments, and we will. Uh, you will hear from us in a follow-up email soon with the link to the webinar. 
and um, the, the comments in the chat box. So once again, thank you all very much for participating today.